I've got my red dot. G'day. One in four people out there are taking a pill for anxiety today, according to medical research. And people are choosing whether to be happy or whether to be anxious. Hand up those of you who think sometimes that you get a bit anxious about things. Yeah? Well, guess what? Anxiety is the inability to see something successful in the future. <laughs> Go figure. So we can step one step into the future, see whatever it is we're anxious about, and see it in perfect shape, successful and happy, and we're no longer anxious. Because we have the ability to do that with the power of our subconscious mind. We're amazing, absolutely amazing. There was research done in 1934. And this project was developed, and it was called the Gross Domestic Product. And it was put out by a guy by the name of Kesnutz. And he said, let this be the measurement of helping the American people get through the Great Depression. And all the countries used it. It's now 70 years old. So the wellness of our country, the happiness of our country, has been based on a program that was developed 70 years ago. And it's been all around money. It's been around jobs and wealth. And so our socialization process has also been like that. But it's interesting now that the United Nations are saying that in future, we should look at happy people as being the measure of a country's wealth. Who thinks that should be the case? <laughs> Maybe Canada is going to get some high points. <laughs> because the wellness of a country, you know, people are saying, we're not happy. Jan, we're not happy. Since 1960, 60,000 people have been researched in 60 countries. And they're saying, we're just not happy. While wealth has doubled and in sometimes tripled, even through a recession, happiness hasn't. So the United Nations is saying, in the future, let's measure the happiness of our people in order to measure how we're really going as a race. So what are we doing? Where is your vision of happiness? Is it based around the dollar because of the gross domestic product? How many of you keep thinking, I'm just going to get, I've got that last contract. I'm, I'm so close to getting it. I'm so close to getting that dollar to make it happen. I'm so close to doing this. I'm so close to doing that. And we're always chasing the dollar. I remember going there. I got lupus doing that, a disease of the immune system. It doesn't work. And how many of you have made the dollars or think you can get the dollars and then that's going to bring you happiness? And how many people do you know that have done that and they're not happy? How many people have won the lottery or won great wealth and they're not happy today? So let's share about what you want because apparently so many of you aren't feeling very happy and we need to do something about that. The research therefore shows that rather than have money, what you would prefer would be health. You see, when Kesnitz put out his research, he said, let this be a short-term research. Is 70 years short-term? In the scheme of things, maybe it is. But it's time for change, is it not? Time for absolute change. And I love being a change maker. <laughs> we don't actually change anybody, but it's great to instigate it. You know, when I talk about health, I've got some great examples. You see, when I was a kid growing up, I was so well, I was so healthy. I was a tennis player, I was a soccer player, I rode bikes, I did whatever. And I became a, quite a good tennis player. I played tennis for the state, I played tennis for my school, I played tennis for the University of Oregon. I worked four jobs for four years and put myself through university here at the University of Oregon. And while I was at that university, I swam a mile a day, and I played tennis for the university, and in between I did two degrees. Why? Because I thought I could. I had no idea about what I was doing to my body. I just thought because I had so much energy, I could use it up to the hilt. I even hitchhiked across your Canadian Rockies at minus 35 because I needed a field work experience, a co-op, if you will, a chance to get some experience in just 
recreation administration at an administrative level and I was offered an opportunity and the guy didn't give me money or transport and I'm a student. So I hitchhiked. I haven't hitchhiked before and I certainly haven't hitchhiked since. <laughs> but all I could see was the goal. Yeah, I need to be there at 7.15 on Monday night and it's now Friday. So I hitchhiked and I figured you had to either show your sexy legs, which I don't have, or a thumb. So I showed my thumb and I wore an Australian t-shirt. Everyone picked me up because they wanted to go to Australia. So that was really cool. And I remember a big sign in British Columbia and it said, no hitchhiking. I went, oh, maybe I need to stand over here then because there's no sign here. I was that gullible. I mean, I just did what I felt like I needed to do. I came back from that experience and I decided that after I graduated, I was going to go and find my dad's family because we were really happy as a family and I couldn't understand why my dad didn't have that same connection with his family. You see, he swapped ships in the war. They asked him to come across to Australia, Australian ships, because we needed his expertise and he ended up staying there. He met my mum and the rest is history. Nine kids later, seven kids later, nine in the family. And so I wanted to go and find family. And I met this guy on the campus and I said, hey, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to stay in America and teach them how to play soccer. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to England to find my dad's family. He said, wow, that's cool. He said, I've got a ticket that I'm not using. Why don't you take that? And you've got a job you're not going to do. Why don't I take that? So we swapped. How cool. You see, the minute you want to do something, the universe sends it to you. How many times do you brush it away? But then I went, oh my gosh, his name's on the ticket. My name's on the passport. Oh, well, what can they do, I said. They can just fly me home and I'll pay them back later. That's what I thought. So I ended up in England. Was it easy? No. However, I made it. They made me go through the declared section. They gave me a whole bunch of hoo-ha, but they let me in the country. Thank you. And I found my dad's family. And I did a six-month safari through Africa because when you're in Australia, it's such a long way away, you might as well do whatever you can on the way home. So I did this six-month safari right through Africa because that was another dream. And I caught the last boat home and I was pretty spent. I knew what bad health was like. I'd had dysentery in Africa. I had lupus. I had you name it. I had, I had filariasis. I had swollen kidneys. <laughs> I had the lot. I remember going through the Tropical Diseases Centre and he was so happy when I walked in because I was a mess. So he had someone to work on. Yeah, I had big lumps in my groins, big lumps here. That's what a lupus patient looks like because their immune system's out of whack. And so I wasn't getting anywhere going to him. He couldn't find anything. Yeah, because you know what? Wellness and happiness is inside of us. And so I did, I started working at the university because I could. I, had, I was the only person in Australia, there was one other person with me that had a degree in, in recreation management. And then after I did the four years at the university, an ad in the paper came in. It was my dream job. And it was setting up a program in a hospital because the nursing staff, the research of nursing staff was that their health was worse than the patient's. <laughs> so I thought, this is just so cool. This is like rent a crowd, you know? 5,000 staff in a hospital and I'm going to be in charge of their happiness and their wellness. I was so excited. But they had no idea who they'd connected with. Because as they showed me around the hospital, all I'm thinking of in that cafeteria, I can run aerobics programs, dance programs, we can have yoga, we can have, and then they showed me the next place. And then they showed me the physiotherapy department and I'm thinking massage therapy, what else can we do? All sorts of things. And I looked at the swimming pool and I thought we can have 300 people a week learning to swim here. Children, adults, elderly. We can have aqua fitness. My head was going hell for leather. And so I started putting ideas all around. It was just like this. And I put ideas on bits of paper all around the cafeteria. And in six weeks I had a program started because I had 200 signatures of people that told me what they wanted. In the meantime, I'm trying to get over lupus. I'm trying to increase my wellness. And as I was learning how to do it for me, I was doing it for others. So I shared it. I brought in wellness programs into the hospital. Yeah, programs like Chinese medicine. Go figure. It took six years of courage to do that. I started a program in um, 
travel, a half a million dollar program. We took the disabled, we took the elderly. Because of one statement my mother said, she said, you know, um, I'm 60 now, by 68 I'll probably be dead because my mother was dead at 68. I said, how can you think like that? And that made me change what I was doing and I started running rejuvenation camps for the elderly to get them to think differently. That everything's only a thought away. And so I took busloads down to the snowy mountains, the most beautiful air that we have. And I took nutritionists down and I gave them choices. And in the meantime, I'm getting well. Because I learned about the power of minerals. I learned that when you take vitamins, they're useless without minerals. And so I started taking minerals because they fed my muscles. I learned that minerals make hormones and that hormones isn't just about sex. Hormones was a really important thing in your body. And then if you were short of a hormone called progesterone, you didn't feel chirpy. It's the feel-good hormone. And not many people feel good, yeah? So most people that I'm coaching today, I look at them holistically because they're not feeling good. They're missing so much in their health regime because of the lack of understanding of what we need. So I started taking minerals. I started walking. I started relaxing more, which was really huge for me because when the doctor said, you need to meditate, I said, who's got time for that? Like, I've got a life. You know, I'm teaching aqua fitness on the way home from running a hospital job. And I had a life. All I wanted was to be able to bring wellness to the world and to have people as happy because I thought you could do anything you wanted. I'd already proved it. And so I started to work on my health. And I started to work as I worked on my health. I spread that knowledge out to other people. And I could see things changing dramatically. In the end, we had 1,000 people a week coming to the program. It became a million-dollar business for the hospital. So health brought in wealth, not sickness, not illness. It was like turning a sick house into a wellness centre. It was phenomenal for an institution to change that way. And I was so adamant that they needed to change. Because you see, only the sick get to use them, but all of us pay for them. And so my thought was that everyone should be able to come and use it. We need to understand that health is, when you think about great health in your body, your whole body changes. When you think about great happiness in your body, your whole body changes. And when you're not, your body changes. So when you're not thinking health thoughts, your body can go into cortical steroids and it can clamp up and all sorts of things can uh, manifest. I did it. I was a champion at it. And when you think about happiness, all sorts of wonderful things can happen in your body. Your liver can start producing new enzymes. Your hormones change. Your adrenal glands change. Your heart starts to pound in a different beat. We can create wellness just by having happy thoughts. So what is it that's going to make you happy? Awareness is the key. For us to be aware of who we are, that we can be, do and have anything we want. Joel Bauer said, God's gift to you is more talent and ability than you can ever use in your lifetime. Your gift is to give as much of that back as you can in your lifetime. What are we doing? When I heard that, that moved me like that. I absolutely moved into a whole different level. And I thought, every day I'm going to make a difference. There's no more anxiety. Or if it is, it's going to be short-lived because I know how quickly to get through it. I can go next and dismiss that thought and focus on how can I make that happen. What's the saying? How can I make it happen? When you say that, all you look at is the possibilities. You see, how many of you, if you had to hitchhike across the Canadian Rockies, would have had a second thought? How many of you would have got a bit anxious about that? Yeah? Well, all I could see was the goal at the end. The same as I did in China and all the other work I've done. How can I make it happen? The other thing you need to do is start believing in you, who you are. That belief brings faith. And belief and faith bring great action. And when you act and believe, it rotates. And you can't stop it. It's the most beautiful process. When I took my books to China and helped with the earthquake victims, I couldn't stop the rotation. It was beautiful. I don't even speak a word of Chinese. How did that happen? I just believed that I was meant to be there at the time and I could do that. And the third point is about 
you getting to cause, what does that mean? It means you being responsible for your life. The minute you blame anybody or anything for your state changing, yeah? Like you want to come to Australia and you're scared of snakes or spiders? The minute you see one of those things and they change your state, just imagine something as small as your fingernail changing your whole state. Who's in charge here? So when you get to cause, it's about you, not blaming anybody, but you taking control of what you can do in your world. And it's a wonderful feeling. Is it easy? No. But it's wonderful because when you take control of your world, you become, as Roger Hamilton says, you become the wharf and the ships will come to you. You don't have to run around and do anything. Everything will be offered to you because you've got this exuded energy that goes out and affects so many more people. So happiness, my friends, is a choice. And happiness is your choice. And I hope you choose that from now on. Who'd like to choose happiness? Thank you.